Hey everybody, this is Tim Anderson. I'm the programming coordinator for the Florida Film Festival and this is our Filmmaker Forum for program shorts number one. Um, and gosh, I'm really excited. This is the first time we've ever done a Zoom like this and uh, hopefully you guys are going to enjoy it as much as we have. We've got a great collection of the filmmakers that are represented in this block with us today. Um, let me go ahead and get them to introduce themselves. Uh, let me start with Doug. Hey, my name is Doug Rowland, and my film is Feeling Through. Awesome. Uh, Yi. Hi, uh, my name is Yi. Uh, my film is Black Gold. And uh, I guess uh, Zach and Jen are going to do yours together. Yeah, I'm um, Zachary Grady. My film's Island Queen with Jen, Jen Harris. <laughs> I'm Jen Harris with Zachary Grady. Our film's Island Queen. All right, uh, Adam. Hey, I'm Adam. Um, I'm writer and director of Union County. And that brings us to Brooke and her special guest, Kate. Yeah, hi, I'm Brooke Tranter, the director and co-writer of Oh Baby, along with... Hi, Kate Morgan Chadwick, executive producer and main person. And co-writer co and co all the things, yes. Stop. Just say stop. <laughs> I can't say. <laughs> okay. Um, so... I guess what I want to do is open up. We have a lot of film school students that watch these, and a lot of film school students based in Orlando, uh, where we've got like four film schools. And so a lot of the things that I think that the, the filmmakers look at is, um, you know, when they're watching shorts, they're asking themselves, you know, how, how did this come about? How did, what was the inspiration behind it? And like, how can I, you know, what can I take away from these kind of films to be able to make something similar myself? You know, what are, what were the perils and pitfalls and whatnot? So I guess the kind of main question that I'd love to know from you guys at the beginning is sort of um, with only a finite amount of time in your lives and the world and, you know, with an, you know, the same amount of resources, why you chose this film and this story to sort of like, you know, put your life on the, your cinematic life on the line for. And, and actually I will start this one in the same, kind of succession that everybody introduced themselves and then we'll bounce around from there. So Doug, I'll let you kick it off. Great, well, yeah, that's a great question. I have a very specific answer for it in this case. And to kind of uh, summarize about nine years worth into like a short response, real quickly, this was inspired. Uh, I, I'm, I currently live in Los Angeles, but at the time of the inspiring event, I, I lived in New York City where I'm from. And I was coming home really late one night and had an encounter with the first deafblind person that I'd ever met. Um, I sat with him and waited with him for a bus uh, that he needed. And we ended up communicating with um, the only way that I could figure out how to communicate with him, not knowing how to sign or even knowing what tactile sign language was at the time, which was me writing one letter at a time on his palm and him writing back in a notepad. And we had, you know, a, a whole like hour long, like get to know you conversation that way that shifted initially from kind of like basic, you know, back and forth to really like a lot more personal in-depth kind of conversation. And it was one of those kind of moments in your life where you just like, it's this very visceral feeling throughout the whole thing. And you kind of like, even while you're in it, know that there's something really significant happening. Um, and it would be kind of later on in first writing a short story, kind of just recounting the events to then later on writing the film that became Feeling Through, I realized that so, and then beyond that, partnering with the Helen Keller National Center to both cast the deafblind actor in the role, um, which again, the, the film Feeling Through is just a fictional film that's inspired by that account. Yeah. It's not a retelling of it per se, but um, working with Helen Keller National Center to, to cast a deafblind actor, which we found out was a film first when we were making the film, to then making these, uh, fully accessible events that we've taken across the country called the Feeling Through Experience, which include the film as well as a supporting documentary and a panel discussion with the deafblind community. After all that, it was years later, that whole process is a course of like eight years, um, that I realized that I, the reason that I made it, which I guess is the question that you're asking as well, is I realized that in that moment of having never met anyone who was deafblind, I first saw this man, Artemio, um, as essentially as his disability in that the first thoughts in my mind were, oh, wow, this is the first deaf blind person I've ever met, which is a natural reaction for someone in that situation. But it was over the course of really connecting with him and really almost feeling by the end of our encounter that he was like a friend where we're giving each other a hug goodbye and I'm tearing up going like, oh, I'm going to miss my buddy. Um, realizing that we connected in a way that was much more about 
who he is as a person and yeah. his deaf blindness being one aspect and certainly an aspect of that, but one aspect was kind of like the light bulb aha inspiration behind not just making the film, but all of the, uh, the, the, the event and all of the advocacy and awareness work that has stemmed from. I think the movie is phenomenal. I mean, this is a movie that we took away from as selection committee or as myself um, being on a member of the short film selection with Kat Whitaker and Susie Spang, who unfortunately couldn't be here on this call with us, um, is that, you know, we always feel like as, as programmers that we, you know, we always want to connect emotionally to a story, or if we're not going to completely be emotionally connected to a story, we want to be blown away by it, the film from a, you know, a artistic standpoint. Um, but, in, you know, you always often feel like you've seen every story before, but this was really unique. Like, I don't know if I could ever really say that I saw, I've seen a, a short film that really tackled this subject. Certainly not in the way that it's being addressed as well, which is this very kind of beautifully internalized film about one man. I mean, as much as it is about your deafblind actor, it's very much the story of your, your main protagonist in the film um, and sort of his eyes opening to the world. So yeah, we, we loved it. Um, Thank you. E, let's move on to you. Sorry, what did you just say? Uh, sa same question. <laughs> uh, essentially, looking for. Um, I, I mean, we've seen. I've seen a lot of coming of age kind of films, but this is a unique in the most amazing way. Not only is it visually beautiful, Thank um, you. but it's just not a story that I've seen done. It's certainly not done in the way, I mean, honestly, I always thought I was pretty well versed and, you know, I read books on Buddhism. And things. I had actually no idea that there were women Buddhist monks. Oh, really? Like, That's... I just I never encountered that. Oh, okay. Uh, they're called nuns, Buddhist yeah. nuns. Um, so I'm from China. I'm not from Nepal. And it took me a while to... Um, realize that there is an issue about cultural appropriation. Yeah, yeah but um, I'm really glad that I did it with, um, with a, from a more personal perspective so that it's not anything that is rude. Um, it's probably also okay to be rude. Um, so the first time, um, I, I always feel a very special connection with Nepal. The first time I went to Nepal was 2010 uh, with a school tour. I went to university in Hong Kong and we stay in a monastery where there are a lot of nuns and monks. And they were so quiet and they stay away from us all the time. I wanted to talk to them, but they always seem very shy until one day I caught them doing selfie with their own phones and mm. listening to Justin Bieber. It was 2010, so it was baby. You know, like yeah. every monk and nun, they know how to sing baby. I didn't even know the lyrics at that time. I think it's so, only got two words in the whole song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I feel that even though we are very different, we are from different worlds, we have different life experiences, but there's something in common that we that it's between humans, that is between you and me. And I ended up adding all those monks and nuns, now they're my friends, on Facebook. And I kept in touch with them throughout the years. And, and um, I'm, my, I myself is a Buddhist too, and my destiny took me to Tish. I'm, I'm currently in my thesis year at Tish, and Black Gold was my uh, second year film. And, mm -hmm. um, at that time, I just made the decision that I want to I wanna make a film about this world that I have always been amazed about. And I, I'm sure that a lot of people haven't seen this world yet, or they haven't seen this world as what I seen. So a bunch of monks and nuns, they are like, just like us. Yeah. So I went to Nepal again in the summer of 2017. And I try to look for different uh, locations um, at different monasteries and most of the locations just fell through because I'm a woman. I'm a foreign woman trying to make a movie about Buddhism. And it, it, it's just a little bit offensive to a lot of male religious leaders. And then one of my friends told me, okay, if you want to make a movie about this, you probably can um, go to Anishwain Droma, 
she is a um, feminist chanting singer in Nepal. Like she's a Buddhist nun, but she's also a rock star. So if there's anyone that can help you with this, that's her. Oh, that's so awesome. I went to her and I, I, I made this proposal about this film. Um, it's about this um, girl, this new girl to the nunnery having her first menstruation. And I want this to be a fantastical movie yeah. instead of like being completely um, traumatized or like menstrual shaming. There is yeah. probably a little bit touch of it, but I wanted to make it like a more personal experience. Yeah. And she said yes immediately, but she told me that I have to um, stay with the nuns. Yeah, and I was, at first I thought it would be a little bit too offensive, this, the content itself. So I was like, okay, so I get the location. I get the nuns. You've seen all the girls in my movie. They're great. They're yeah. so natural in yeah. front of the camera. And then I was like, okay, so what if my story is a little bit too offensive for them? Should I just change the subject a little bit? But it turns out that they are all like, young little feminists they want to make a difference and they are okay to talk about this issue i'm like okay oh my god i'm gonna do this yeah and then under the um and then to make that movie work um the principal of school told me that i have to use um um a female crew like all principal okay. creative crew members have to be female but Nepal is a very male dominant society and there's, they never heard of female ACs or gaffers or like sound person in Nepal. So I ended up flying my classmates and my schoolmates from Tish and mm. sound women from India to eventually make this film work. And for me, this film was, this is my first short and there are so many flaws in it, but it was just amazing that I, I got to work with local crew, yeah. local cast with so much support from everybody and also from my school. So I, I, I feel that this is a very good experience for me. Yeah. And no. also learn to, um, I don't know, like Ang Lee is my role model He's a Taiwanese director. I yeah. guess you guys all know him, right? And yeah. he's a deal, right? Okay. <laughs> and uh, um, he makes a lot of movies that it's not from his own culture. Yeah. But that will work. That's because we find something human in all of us. So yeah. I want to be like that. And that uh, is my first attempt. That was my first attempt. Yeah. I, it's, I still it, it, keep in touch with all the girls. You yeah, did an incredible girls. job. Your first Thank attempt you. is gold. gold. <laughs> so, like, congratulations. Yeah. I've, I'd like to add just one of the things that makes this film so joyous is um, is that it's so unexpectedly irreverent. You never, you just don't expect it, you know, given the subject matter, you think it's going to be this traditional story and it feels so modern. And I, that's part of, I think, what makes it so wonderful. So congratulations. Thank you. So Zachary and Jen, we saw Island Queen, you know, a long, I, everything we saw now feels like we watched it like a year ago. Um, <laughs> did, in some cases we did. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly when this was, but I do know that it came out far before Rachel Dratch was doing Boston accent jokes with uh, John Krasinski on TV. And we've played a lot of stuff in the festival too that Jesse's been in over the years. But this movie's a riot. Like, I mean, mm. we could not stop <laughs> laughing. Um, so I, this is when I want to know a little bit about the inspiration behind it. Also want to know about, you know, how much of, you know, dealing with that kind of insanity on a set is like, because I imagine they, they cut each other up quite a bit. Uh, yeah. Um, Zach, you want to, you want to start with the yeah, story yeah. Uh, since you wrote it? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I grew up working on that boat. I, I was a teenager uh, through, through high school, worked on that boat and always wanted to make something I foolishly wrote a feature thinking that that would be what we made. And then I was like, just sitting, I, I had, Jen had been in a play I wrote, that's how we met about a year prior. And I got permission to use the boat. So we were like, let's just make a short, a short version of it. And um, it kind of happened quickly because the boat had to open by a certain date. It's a seasonal yeah. boat. So it was one of those situations of like, time was a constraint and it just like before we knew it we were 
in the middle of it. And um, so it was fast and like, it's, it's totally, uh, you know, I was a little gay kid working on a boat in Massachusetts that has like a very masculine energy in every aspect of it. And I just did not feel like I fit in, but the, everyone on that boat was so charming and wonderful. And I always kind of wanted to write a weird little love letter to that crew. And this is kind of it. Um, that's the inspiration. Um, and then the other, just about like the, I don't know if Jen wants to add anything to that. Yeah, always interested in the idea of trying to contain comedic personalities on your set. Oh, I, it's not about contain. I mean, I'll, I'll share. It's not, <laughs> I think it's sort of like a lot of times comedy and improv and you think it's like some like crazy wild people out of control having fun. And it's like the most utter professional, clean, I mean, these, these individuals, everyone, even uh, Daniel Rampula, our, our uh, cinematographer, understand comedy to a point where it is just fast, clean, sharp, and precise. I mean, that doesn't mean that it isn't fun and we don't have moments of like laughing, but there's nothing out of control to Rachel Dratch and Jesse Tyler Ferguson's artistry, like mm -hmm. at all, or Zachary's yeah. like writing or anything. I think there's, there's like a very free math to really well-performed comedy. Yeah. And I think that um, also as organized, you know, it's that thing where you're like, I'll speak for myself. You can never plan enough. Never, 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 <laughs> never, never. But we just plan and plan and plan and plan and plan. And as long, and I think that a lot, Zachary and I really did have a goal, tell me if I'm wrong, Zachary, that we just really wanted to have everything taken care of as, as cleanly as possible and as, as, as um, handed to them as a gift that's mm. safe, clean, and effective so that they feel they have the space to play. And Zachary and I, yeah. I think, just knew that from being performers ourselves. So maybe that was something that, that's something that I leaned on as a first time director. But I, um, I also just, part of like why doing this, um, I love Zachary's work. Again, I was in a play of his and he, I love his writing. We just got, a, it was one of those things where we just got along really well as people and finished each other's sentences. <laughs> yeah. And I love co collaborating with friends. Like I just want to make fun things with my friends. And so if a friend's like, I want to make something, it's like, wait, we have a boat? <laughs> Yeah. We have the boat. I'm, I was like, what do you mean we get the boat? I was like, well, then we're going to make it. We're going to do yeah. something. Let's figure it out. If we have the boat, <laughs> that's everything. <laughs> like, yeah, that's and, just like everything. And um, something interesting is like Jen and I come from theater. Our entire cast has done theater. Yeah. So there was just a shorthand about like what we were doing performance wise, that everyone was on the same page. And the improv was very... Um, it wasn't like we were riffing and letting the camera roll. It was just like Rachel and Jesse being so genius would just have an idea and they'd insert it and then we'd just move on. And then in the editing room, we were like, they gave us a little gift. Look at that thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and there's nothing chaotic about their performance. It's just like, boop, and then you move on. It was great. Yeah. It's a very skilled, like it's a very wonderful thing to watch when you watch comedians, co comic actors that just well-versed, that well-practiced, that there's, there's, you're just gonna get more than yeah. what you asked for and it's clean and it's like, next. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on? Okay, great. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> oh, we got it. Oh no, we got it. Yeah. Moving on. <laughs> uh, well, again, like I said, we, I mean, I think, we laughed like so loud we couldn't hear parts of the movie over us laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so Zach, besides the boat, how much else of this was autobiographical? I mean, were, were you forced to play hockey or and were you I figure mean, skater? You know, I mean, I learned to play. I learned to skate when I was the height of a milk crate. Like that's my earliest memory. And I just you just played hockey in my hometown. Yeah, and my sister figure skated. And wow. I learned all of her routines and I did them in my <laughs> socks in my kitchen. And uh, um, I quit hockey to do theater. And so it was sort of yeah. like, uh, I always just knew that I wanted that little through line of a character that um, didn't, wasn't doing what he wanted to do. It's just a very wow. universal thing. And yeah. for me, it was, I, I was at the hockey rink watching the figure skaters in my hockey gear, learning their routines. And that's just <laughs> something that's very true to my childhood. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. I love that. 
Um, Adam, uh, it brings us to Union County. Um, this, this is a rough film. And we, I've seen a lot, again, as programmers, we watch so many movies. And I think we watched over a thousand shorts this year for just the narrative competition. So just domestic made short films. And, you know, Opoid Crisis in America is a pretty heavy, you know, situation that's going on. And, you know, we've seen content on this before, but this is one of those kind of perfect short films in that a short film does not have to have a complete story. Sometimes it can just be a moment in someone's life. And that moment is so well realized that you may not know where it's going to go after the film ends, but you really feel like you understand where the story starts and how you got to the area where you, you introduce the character. So this is again a movie I kind of want to talk to you uh, not about the inspiration, but also a really interested in sort of the decision to shoot this. It's not, it's not a quiet film in that there's not a ton of dialogue, but it's just a very like reflective film essentially as it's, as it's, as we're watching it. Like it feels yeah. like a secret movie where we're hmm. kind of voyeuristically peeking in on someone's life. Yeah. Um, thanks for saying that. So, yeah, I, I am from that part of Ohio originally, and um, around, I guess, I guess around the 2016 election, I started to feel really compelled to put that part of uh, America on screen, both its, like, physical landscape, because I find there to be something sort of surprisingly beautiful about, like, yeah. Ohio in the Midwest that is not really recognized, I find, and I, at the same time, also the sort of socioeconomic landscape felt like it was much more complicated, broadly speaking, than I was hearing on sort of NPR from LA or whatever. And so I wanted to, um, I started there and then I met, um, because I have family there, I sort of met the, the judge whose voice is in the film. And I, I, he invited, when he heard I was a filmmaker, he invited me to his drug court. Um, I expressed some interest. I started sitting in on his drug court meetings and meeting people without really knowing what I was going to make or how I was going to make it. Um, but knowing that the more time I spent with them, the more um, I was just really compelled by this, the, the sort of warmth and hope and, um, and um, j just the sort of how much of that experience contradicted what I'd previously seen on screen and what I felt had been previously represented. And so I started doing a lot of research and I recognized, it, I started asking people when I was there, um, what's a thing, um, something that they feel it has been misrepresented or ignored by the media in sort of their experience. And the kind of unanimous response was recovery. Um, mm -hmm. That we've all, we're all hearing the overdose statistics and we're, we've seen that and there are these stigmas around it across the board, but that there are also these stories of people getting better that happens on a daily basis. That's not without its struggles, but that is still, you know, but that, that, that's, a, that's a meaningful story to tell also. So um, it was sort of born from that. I met a kid who in drug court who had told me that he was living in his car on the outskirts of town and that the hardest part of his recovery was having to break up with his ex who was still using. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And immediately I was like, there's, that's, that's everything that I've been trying to figure, figure out how to communicate. Um, and so um, I, I I'm so glad that you said that, Tim, about what it felt like watching it, because I really wanted to do that. I wanted to, like, um, it felt important that it came from the people themselves. Um, I knew the landscape. I knew the environment. I knew the people and sort of the connecting the dots, but I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to talk about it from personal experience the way that each person does from in their unique experience. And so we cast the film, it, almost entirely with non-actors who are from that community for playing versions of themselves. And um, so everybody except for the lead are all the real people from that community. Who would, um, I knew that I needed an, an actor in that central role, somebody with acting experience who could sort of communicate a lot in a, sh in a small moment and yeah. who the other actors who hadn't acted before could sort of, could sort of lean on at times. Um, and yeah, I, tried to, I really tried to sort of cast it right. Um, I tried to cast it right and st and structure it right, and then just like put the camera in the right place and let it roll, basically, um, and sort of stay out of the way. And so um, we tried to be 
we tried to be direct but unimposing and sort of let the people and the experience kind of communicate, speak for itself. Um, uh, um, and I think it's incredibly successful. Like, thank you. I feel like, you know, I feel like the movie is hopeful. At the end of the movie, I want to believe that the struggle that he's going through to have to essentially walk away from that relationship, that he's going to make it. You know, I'm, you might not, you never know, but I just, I, what I like about the ending of the film is without wrapping up a nice, neat, tidy ending, I feel like this guy's got a really good shot. So we're rooting for him, I guess. Would be That's that. great. Yeah. yeah, that was the goal. Yeah, I think as Tim mentioned, we get so many, we look at so many films over the months and, um, you know, you see a lot of popular, a lot of themes are popular and they're reoccurring in the films we're getting. And obviously we get a, a bunch of films that deal with drug abuse and, um, you know, drug themed short films. And this one just stood out so much for us. It felt so honest and so immersive in the world that you present. And I think we all, we unanimously felt that way. It definitely, um, it stood out clearly. So congratulations on that. It's really good. Thanks so much. Yeah, I appreciate that a lot. So building on themes, this year is, um, I don't know if it's something in the water. I don't know if it's <laughs> the makeup of the selections team this year was myself and two women or, but for some reason, we have an insanely large amount of competition films this year that are essentially informed by or specifically about either pregnancy or motherhood. Um, I, there's like five in of the like 30 so that are in competition that are literally about someone who's pregnant. Um, so that's going to bring me to Oh Baby. Um, and I, you know, it's funny as we watch, they're actually got three movies this year named Oh Baby. Um, submit it. I swear oh. to you. What, so, I'm just saying maybe IMDb that title sometime. <laughs> but this one, this one knocked us on our butts in terms of like the one, the, the first reveal um, at the date. And then secondly, and I don't want, I hate the idea of saying a fearless performance when you do something that's like not considered conventionally like something actors or actresses do. Um, but I, again, I would like to know a little bit about the inspiration behind this. I have, I have theories um, mm -hmm. in my head and maybe I'm totally wrong. Uh, but I also want to know about like, um, just like having the like, uh, the cojones, so to speak, to just shoot this short mm -hmm. um, and really go for it. Cause this short goes for it. It's Frank, yeah. That was the intention. Uh, Kate and I had worked on a short the year before and uh, we knew we wanted to work together. And um, do you want to talk about your experience leading up to getting pregnant at all? No. Okay. And then we had decided that it was definitely going to focus on Kate. And, um, and then Kate got pregnant. And so we started meeting and we immediately knew we wanted it to be about that. Kate yeah. had this dream and we were both very in sync about having her pregnant on set. Um, so uh, then we just started talking about how pregnant women are portrayed in film and media and, and what it's really like to be pregnant and the experiences that you go through. And I think something that came up in a lot of our research was um, um, the fact that pregnant women are very sexy. There's something very sexy about a woman that is growing life and, and we don't talk about it. And, yeah. and as a matter of fact, I think sen sensuality and sexuality within a pregnant woman is often shame, shamed in, in our culture. And so we just wanted to rip the Band-Aid off and go for it. And <laughs> we did. Yeah, we oh, did. you did. You did. Right. It's amazing. Like, Thank there was you. like cheering. Like people were oh, in the screening room over the shore. Oh, they yeah. Were. I think from just a, from a, performer's perspective too I I think sometimes people watch a film like this and they think oh that girl must that must have been in her wheelhouse somehow like yeah no it was totally it wasn't something I was like looking forward to doing but at the same time once we were faced with it it just felt really fun and right and um and uh just spur of the moment we shot it really that whole sex scene we shot yeah. in under half an hour okay. well 
it was it was structured and we had a we had an <laughs> idea of a storyboard but um kind of uh backpacking on what jen and zach were talking about uh, my background's in improv and that's how i direct and write a lot of the time and i understand the 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 precious beauty in just being in the moment and kate i knew i've known kate for years that's when she's the most delightful is when she's just present in there so casting the right person opposite her was a uh, yeah. an important factor in that but she had known tj yeah. for years so i, I was kind of curious about that as well because yeah we talk about that in uh, uh some other times and over in q a's over the years which is this idea about like did you test them together or did you already know there was chemistry there you know or was it like hi i'm the person who's going to be having sex with you today on set and that oh, was no. like when we started writing it i think and had an idea of what these characters were uh, we had known TJ or Kate had, and we really, we wrote it for him. We wrote it for him, mm. hoping that he would say yes. And obviously if he hadn't, we would have, we would have figured it out, but it, yeah. all the pieces kind of fit together. Yeah, but well, we love it. I mean, it's a riot. So, and I'm sure it's the audience that, that just got through seeing it. It's also going to be talking about it for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, this is actually a chance where I kind of get to throw it to you guys. You know, you've all had the chance to see each other's work, and I really kind of am fascinated to know if you all have questions for each other about specific things that happened inside of your films. So um, we can do this however you want, but if anybody wants to just kind of jump out at it, just, you know, like, I don't know, shake a hand at the screen and, you know, just start talking, and we'll try to keep it structured to a degree. So Brooke has a question. Or uh, yeah, practice, I, practice waving. Great. I have a question for everyone. I know we won't get to time, but like maybe I'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk later. Um, <laughs> over Zoom, obviously. <laughs> Adam, uh, I have a question for you. I, I also come from the Midwest and it's always been um, my dream and I hope it does happen to make a short or a feature or something from where I come from, for, from where my roots are. I'm really proud of proud of where I come from. And I love what you said about the Midwest and the beauty that's found there. Um, I, I'm actually just curious, what was it like to, to go back and make a, or I'm actually, where are you? In New York and Brooklyn. New York, New York, okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm just curious what that experience was like to go back and work with people of the community, what that felt like as a filmmaker. Yeah, it was, it was amazing because um, I think the, the heavy lifting was, was, early on like in prep before we even started shooting just sort of just sort of um communicating intentions and making sure that everybody felt like they were in good hands you know and then from that point on it was like this sort of community project it was sort of like you know that what's beautiful about making films outside of like new york and la is that like people get so excited when they see a camera and they want to help yeah. out you know and it's not there's no there's like cynicism or jadedness around filmmaking yeah. it's like it's like, oh my God, like, how can we help you? And so we had this, this sort of beautiful support and, um, uh, and resources and, you know, and it was just really like positive and really, you know, I went to NYU also like ye, I went to Tisch and um, making films in New York City is like impossible. And making films in rural Ohio felt like so, like the focus could be on like the people and the creative process and not about like how you're gonna get a equipment truck from Long Island to wherever, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, I, I loved it. And I'm, I, I just sort of wanna do more of that, honestly. I love that. And just one quick uh, follow up, was your crew mostly from New York that you brought out or were they local? It was a mix. It was a yeah. mix. I, I think I brought down mostly key, key like, uh, department heads, people I had worked with in the past from New York, and then, and then we brought a lot, a lot of like local help from Columbus and nearby. Yeah. Love it! So inspiring! So inspired! Yeah, you should do it. I, I have a follow up question for Adam too. Like, um, so how many people were there in your crew when you were shooting this film? I really liked it, and it actually reminds me a lot of uh, Chloe Zhao. Uh -huh. I, I, I like that. I, I like that because she only had like eight. She has an eight people crew for the writer. So yeah. I wonder if you if, if you did the same thing. Yeah. yeah, we had we had at at most ten or wow. ten or twelve in a couple of days. But um, but also in certain scenes we had three people like me, camera guy, and sound, like in the court in the drug court stuff. It was just in the corner of the room like me, DP, 
and a boom op and that's it. And I said, everybody else can wait out in the parking lot, you know, and we're just going to be in here, but stay out of the way. And I made sort of rules about like, the, we're not lighting anything. We didn't, we didn't use a single light except for one light in like the last exterior scene when they're, uh, when she comes back and it was pitch dark. That's the only thing that's ever lit, not from whatever the sort of lights are in the room or natural light. And so mm -hmm. I just said like, let's, let's stay out of the way of this in every way. Um, and so, yeah, we were mostly very small. So as a sort of, as a, as a sort of self-imposed restriction to sort of see what that would yield on screen. Um, and I mean, also, you know, logistics and getting people from New York to, to Ohio and stuff, but it, it started out as sort of as a creative instinct. Um, and I, and the close out comparison is like, it's funny because I think that like seeing some of her films along with a couple of the people is sort of what gave me a bit of the courage to try this sort of like hybrid filmmaking in this way, you know? So yeah. Yeah. thanks. Yeah. I have a question uh, yeah. for me. I'm just wondering what the what the animal wrangling process was like. Yeah, I have number that of animals to be a part of that. Animal wrangling process. Okay, so no animal was killed in my film. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I did the. Oh my god, that was so long ago. I I am working on other two films right now. So when you're asking me about the animal part of that film, I'm like. Wow, yeah. Um, so I cast two little goats for myself, <laughs> like a week before my shoot. And at that time, the goat was uh, the the goats were like I don't know, like ten days old or something. It was so small, but then like they can grow so much in one week. Oh no! <laughs> and I had. It's like having babies on yeah. set, you know, like you need to have substitutes babies in case the goats <laughs> are not happy. <laughs> yeah, so, so first of all, I cast two little goats. And, and then um, we have the, we actually got all the goats in, you see a lot of goats eventually in that film. Um, we got the goats very last minute at that time. Like my UPM, um, he's just, uh, I, I, we were about to shoot and then he just went in the mountains and literally, literally there were people, um, what's that word, hurting? The hurting? Yeah, hurting, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they were hurting the goats and they, they just brought all the goats here. And so that, yeah, they were just really friendly. It's like, yeah, it, you're, you're not in big cities. When, when you have a camera, everybody wants to help and everybody wants to be in the film. Yeah, so they were just very, they, they, they were very generous. They, they just brought all their goals. And, and I, I was shooting that, sh I was shooting those shots for like maybe 40 minutes. I don't have more time than that. Yeah, and I had to, do the magic hour thing as well yeah and yeah i hope yeah it worked out at, at first i thought i didn't have enough footage though so like my suggestion is like if you really end up um working with animals you probably need to have more um options yeah <laughs> yeah and you always need more when it comes to animals with a lot of animals yeah i'm not very great with animals like for me no more animals no more, <laughs> no more animals. So the yeah, because the Hollywood cliche is you're not don't work with children and animals, and your entire movie is children and animals. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, and my next film is about old people, so. so. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah, animals are. Yeah, for me, it's like I have these shots when I saw this um little goats on the grass, and then I was just looking them and be like why are they not smiling they're not smiling as i wrote <laughs> but uh, well i would love moment when i realized they're animals and i was just chewing my head yeah <laughs> i would love to keep this kind of q a going forever but um we do need to start to wrap it up so i would like as if everybody um would tell us a little you know just briefly like if you're working on anything um new that you know we can keep our eyes out for um, and I guess we can start with Doug on that, and then I'll just take it around the room one more time. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I guess most topically related to this, we're developing a feature film version of, of Feeling Through. Um, and a lot of the advocacy work we're doing around this is I still, my partnership with uh, the Helen Keller National Center and Helen Keller Services has continued. So, you know, we initially um, pre-COVID had taken the film around the country doing fully accessible screenings with as many as 50 interpreters and support staff to provide tactile ASL, stage interpreters, audio description, unit open captions, um, which we will continue after COVID. Yeah. But in the meantime, um, in addition to doing uh, some live streams of the feeling through experience, which yeah. we're doing with the festival, um, we also do, a, I do a weekly live stream called Feeling Through Live, uh, where I speak with um, people from the deafblind community and beyond. It's a platform for voices in the deafblind community and beyond uh, to talk about topics relevant to everyone. So we we're about 16 episodes into that, I guess, coming this Friday. So we, wow. it was started during COVID and that, that was a way to continue to connect with the community that's particularly um, uh, affected by isolation during a time where touch is prohibitive, a uh, prohibited a community that relies largely on touch. So there's still a lot of stuff that's like happening around this film while working toward um, a feature film version of, of the story. Awesome. Great. And everybody, Good luck. Keep an eye on our social media. We'll post everything about the live stream of the Feeling Through experience um, tentatively set up right now for Thursday the 13th. And one, one quick plug for anyone who wants to, to uh, tune into our weekly live streams, you can find it on youtube.com slash feeling through or facebook.com slash feeling through. We stream to both. Um, there's always an, uh, an ASL interpreter and caption, so it's accessible. Um, and it's cool. We have all our old episodes on our, our YouTube page as well. So for anyone who might want to check that out. All right, so yeah, I know you're about to get on a plane and fly back to Hong Kong and you're in pre-production, so yeah. tell us what you're working on. So I have two shorts. Uh, the, the one that I am going to do is for, uh, uh, is, is for Fresh Wave. It's a Hong Kong short film festival. They gave me some funds so that I can make this next short. It's a coming of age story. It's my own story. It happened when I was 18. Um, I was away, uh, I, I wasn't at home, and my dad wasn't comfortable with um, allowing me to fly home by myself. Then he asked one of his old friends to take care of me on my way home. It turns out that his old friend took me to a dinner party where there's a lot of older men, and I was forced to drink with all of them. At that time, I had no idea what that meant, so I just went along with it until he asked me, do you want to go to karaoke? I was like, yeah, sure, let's go to karaoke. And then it turns out to be a breath hole. And I was the only person that is ordering songs and there were like 30 women coming in. Like some of the girls were at my age and they were like standing in lines, like three lines of women and the older men were just ordering them like I ordered songs. So it was, it had always been a very, um, I was not traumatized at that time. It was mm. all very new to me and yeah. nothing terrible ever happened. Like nothing terrible was happening to me at that time, but you reflect. Yeah. So he grew up. Mm -hmm. I was, yeah, I was 18 knowing nothing at that time, but just growing up, you gradually knows what's happening with, what was happening. Yeah, yeah it was just power play by men and, and that's so I'm really glad that I had I can take this chance to make this film and it, it, it will it will still be a comedy just that's in my nature and uh, then I'm gonna do my thesis which is about a widowed man trying to find love again which is a lot like lighter yeah I'm that's great. looking forward to seeing this um, yeah. Zachary and Jen uh, how about you guys um, <clears throat> I'm the I'm working on a scripted podcast right now, um, something I wrote, uh, and um, it's cool because it's something that we can actually do remotely, yeah. um, but it's, um, that's in the very, very early stages, but that's been my, uh, it's gotten me out of my COVID depression, so that's <laughs> good. <laughs> Man, I'm jealous you got out of it. <laughs> and we'll, we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, um, and I'm uh, working on a short film that I wrote uh, that I'm going to direct, and I'm um, now at the point where I can start uh, doing budget and think of funding and um, 
it should be probably right on time to where when I learn the rules, I can shoot it, but it's in one location. So yeah. I feel, I feel like it'll, it, it'll work, it'll work out, but we'll see. It's set, it's all set in a shower. So, okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll see. So I'm learning about, so I'm spending a lot of time learning about sound in a shower and how I can get these scenes done um, appropriately. Um, so I'm working on that. I just want to say real quick, every single one of these films, this was a great program. And I was, I was inspired both like emotionally and technically by all of the films. And some of the shots, I was just like, that's an amazing shot. And I was like, <laughs> telling my friend, I was like, look, look, look that, that's hard. I was like, that's hard what they did. <laughs> and I just, I really, every single one of these films looked beautiful and um, was really, really fun and inspiring to watch. Like, I, I'm genuinely, I genuinely mean that. So congratulations to everyone. And he, I cannot wait for your films. I am here for those films. <laughs> So Adam, uh, kind of, you know, same question. What are you working on? Yeah, um, I'm in, I'm sort of finishing stages of an edit on a, a little personal documentary short that I made with my parents. Um, yeah. It was a sort of wild journey of talking to them separately about the like years leading up to their divorce from two different perspectives. Um, mm -hmm. Can you guys hear me? Did I break up? Yeah. It's the hair, okay. but we got it all. Okay, okay. Um, so I'm, I'm, I, I, sh I made this film with my parents that I'm sort of finishing up in the edit. Um, and then I'm, I'm working on something feature length, a script feature length that'll be back in this uh, same part of Ohio. Um, not exactly the same narrative, but sort of exploring, exploring that same part of the country in a similar kind of socioeconomic space and, um, and kind of thinking about pushing myself further in this um, documentary fiction hybrid experiment in sort of other ways that I can utilize that space. So yeah. sort of um, outlining and, and researching again for a feature length something in that same world. Great. Brooke and Kate, um, you gonna continue to collaborate or what are you working on separately? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think this is kind of a lifelong. Um, <laughs> right about the press. Uh, no, pre no pressure. You just gotta have work. Guys, we've been very safe too. I don't want you to think because we're together. This is our safe zone. We're She's the only person I've seen in 150 days. It's yeah. fine. Um, no, we're developing a pilot, not based on Oh Baby, but definitely the same themes of empowering women, how we are not seen. Um, in in the media um typically so we're hopefully we're going to be those kind of themes yeah ripping off more band-aids and then i'm working on a feature and yeah i'm working on being a mom oh i guess my baby's asleep right now so <laughs> oh yeah and we are going to move too during this pandemic my husband and i are moving to toluca lake in a month oh okay so everybody's doing it Got to get out of West Hollywood. I mean, yeah, at least you're getting a little further away from people. <laughs> like, yeah. A little. Yeah, a little bit. Um, well, guys, this is an, an incredible group. Um, we're just so proud of this program and the films that you guys made. It's, it's an honor to be, the best thing about being a programmer is to be able to take these things that we get submitted and we watch like in succession over the course of four months and be able to unleash them on the world. And obviously we're in a fairly unique time uh, out there and the idea that we can offer some of these films through the internet, um, through the virtual platform is amazing. Um, these films are all nominated for the Audience Award, so I would encourage you guys that are watching the films uh, virtually, they'll still be, you can vote for them uh, when the movies are over. Uh, if you saw it in the theater, then your opportunity to vote was there. Um, and I would keep an eye out on all of these filmmakers because uh, they're incredibly unique voices, um, pitch perfect comedy, incredibly effective drama, and uh, some films that really make you think, um, even if you're laughing your ass off, you're still thinking, which is always a great thing to do. So thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, and uh, you know we'll see you on the next Q&A and hope you guys are having a great time at the festival. And again, thank you to my amazing you, Shorts Sam. number one filmmakers. Thank you guys. Thanks, Thanks Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank